Hello everyone and welcome to our Act Like a Man podcast and today I have a very special guest and a very good friend from afar. Uh, he is from Dubai, my good friend Peter Isaac, who is our pastor there. And uh, also, our topic for today would be about marriage. And not just any kind of marriage, but interracial marriage. So let's all welcome Peter. Hi Peter, how are you? Very good, Pastor Dennis. Thank you so much. And first and foremost, thank you for having me on your on your podcast. Um, your your work and your and your voice on 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 manning up uh, has been uh, impacted my life and many people's lives here in Dubai. And, uh, it's really an honor to have this conversation along with you. Yeah. So maybe uh, give yes. us a little bit uh, of your love story. All right, I'll, I'll do that. So, well, I was born and raised in Dubai. So even though I'm Indian by ethnicity, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really an Indian, but because I never grew up in India, uh, I'm not an Indian Indian. I'm an uh, Emirati Indian, if that's ever a thing. Um, so I, was, I myself grew up in a very mixed culture. Uh, so I, was, I had a very strong Indian ethics at home, but the people in my, in my world, in my culture, all around me were, were from all over the world. So there was this, always this dynamic of embracing different cultures that was very, uh, it was very personal to me. I enjoyed it. But I never thought I would get married to someone from a different nationality. And I had very, many, many, many reasons thinking that I'm always going to get married to someone from my same ethnicity uh, till I met Candice. And uh, interestingly enough, we met during Youth on Fire. So we had our Youth on Fire chapter in Dubai. So, so, I would, so which year was that? It was 2003 uh, when we got to meet each other. Um, and then we were serving together, we were the same. So we were both in the music team. And then once we moved out from Youth on Fire, we were both serving the local church. Um, and our friendship started to grow there. So the church played a vital part in our friendship growing. Uh, but I think I always battled whether I would really get married to a different nationality. And, uh, and even when it came to Candace, I think there was a point where I was in denial that I really liked this person. Uh, because for me, I was so sure I'm not going to get married to someone from a different nationality. So I think I was in denial for a few months uh, till reality really struck. And uh, long story short, it wasn't easy to get married in terms of family because I, I don't know how it is in the Philippines, but in India, the family has a very big say in who you get married to. And my parents, who are good people, they're good, they're good Christians. In fact, my parents are pastors. They had all the reasons for me to say no. Um, to getting married to Candace, and I think I think those moments shaped my prayer life. Uh, I, I really prayed, Lord, change the heart of my parents. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then finally, in two thousand nine, um, we got married. Two thousand nine Feb, uh, we got married, and uh, I think getting into marriage was, you know, with a different with, with a different national with someone from a different nationality, something that I didn't expect I would do. Um, and you know, I think. Generally speaking, marriage is not easy. And then when you add the interracial, the intercultural aspect to it, I think it, it makes it all the more, um, you know, extremely dynamic. But I'm very grateful for it. Yeah, I think it's the same way with uh, my ethnicity as a Filipino Chinese. Most of the older Chinese are not really that open-minded with interracial marriage. Candice is a Filipina, right? Yes, she is. All yeah, right. Sorry, yeah. for those of you who don't know, yes, Candice is from the Philippines. Right. Um, her, her parents moved her to Dubai when she was 17. So Yeah, what were the yeah, conversations but, before the marriage with your parents? How were you able to convince them that, you know, this is the girl for me, I'm ready for an interracial marriage? Okay, so I, it, that's, there were a few defining moments that happened um, in, in our journey with my parents. So I was about 23 when, or, or maybe... 22, 30, 23, when I knew Candace would be the one for me. Now, I know I was, I was a bit, bit young, but I think at that age, I already knew that this is it. And uh, just about the age of 23, I told my parents that I didn't want to get married to Candace. And they know Candace because uh, our group of friends would come and hang out in my house. So my parents have seen Candace a couple of times, spoke to her a couple of times. And, and this is what my parents would always say because, because they interacted with her. And they said, see, she's a good girl and all. Uh, but you have to consider, um, you know, marriage is this long-term thing. And in India, I don't know, again, the Chinese culture, the Filipino culture, but in India, we have this big thing of what will other people say. 
And initially, that's what my dad told me. It's like, you know, what will other people say? Uh, and, and that was one of the things that I had to really battle with my parents saying that, so what if other people have something else to say? But I did it very respectfully because my dad is a very respected person in his community. He's a pastor. Uh, people really look up to him. So I had to do that with a lot of grace, uh, with a lot of respect. At the same time, let them know that this is something that I really prayed about, something that I really uh, made a decision to follow through. And then my parents started to somehow calm down uh, in terms of their, uh, their expectations. And towards the end, it was like, see, you know what? Uh, the, our only problem is Dubai is not a permanent place. So in case you need to leave the country, where will you go home? Uh, which is home? Is it Philippines? Is it India? And then, you know, we, we said, you know what? We'll just migrate to Canada, okay? And we'll all become Canadians. So, so, so they, were, they were kind of okay with that answer, I guess. But then it was really God who did something uh, in this situation. We were really praying about, um, you know, God really touched the heart of my parents because I really want my parents to bless, bless us and really accept us, receive us. We don't want to go against family. We don't want to be, you know, stirring the pot just because I want to do this. I believe God spoke to me. So, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm, going to just, uh, I'm going to go against what you're saying. I didn't want it to be that way. I really wanted my parents and my family to support what we were doing. Very interestingly, in July of 2008, my parents make a trip to Europe to minister to the churches over there. And they first landed in Birmingham. And the pastor who hosted them, the, 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 per, the, the man, he is from my dad's place in India. And his wife is German. And they're a younger couple. And so there they were for five days staying with this family. And they're watching an interracial marriage of a younger couple. Now, after that, they move to Switzerland. They, they go to Geneva and they're staying with another pastor uh, who's hosting them for another one week. Uh, the pastor, the, the, the man, again, from my dad's town and his wife was a Swiss. And here, this couple is my parents' age. So an older couple who have grown kids. And again, they were watching this interracial marriage for about a week. Somewhere during this week, the pastor asked my dad, so what's your plans for your son? Your son's already about 23. Uh, you know, are you looking for him to get married? And my dad kind of uh, opened up to him by saying, hey, you know, uh, you know, my son is so rebellious. Why? You know, he wants to get married to this Filipino. And he was like, okay, but so what's really the problem? And then that was an eye opener for my dad because there was really no problem. The only problem was it was someone from a different ethnicity. But what was the problem with that? There was no answer. This was July. And I had no idea all this happened. They come back to Dubai and then in September or in August, they go to India for their vacation. And this time it was my grandmother. My grandmother was sitting with my parents and asked my parents, so what's the plan for Peter? Are you looking for, you know, someone that he'll get married to? And again, my parents said, oh yeah, you know, he's got this Filipino girl that he's saying he wants to get married to. And my grandma asked them two questions. Number one, is that girl a Christian? Yes. Is she a good girl? Yes. So what's the problem? <laughs> Why are you standing in their way? And when they came back to Dubai, we had a conversation. And it was a very awkward conversation. I think Indians, we are not, we're not used to having very sentimental, emotional conversations, you know. But we had this awkward conversation where we all agreed, yes, this is maybe the best thing to do. But that's how I knew Pastor Dennis. I think there was a season where I wanted to fight it my way. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to reason out in my way. Mm -hmm. But then... But then there was this, just a scene, about, it took about seven, eight months. It was from, from January 2008 to about uh, August, September 2008, somewhere there. Th that was a time of character building for me. Learning not to fight this with my parents. Mm -hmm. Learning not to disrespect them. Because, you know, I was young. I really wanted this. But God really taught me how to take these things in prayer. God really taught me to trust him that he will move. Because... I mean, think of it, they would go all the way to Birmingham, go all the way to Geneva to see something for themselves so that their heart would change. Uh, so that's how I knew that, you know, prayer had a big part uh, in how my parents eventually agreed to the marriage pushing forward. And today, I can honestly say that you know, I, would, I would often joke, I would tell, I would tell people, I tell my parents, it's like, I feel I am the in-law and Candace is the, is the daughter of the house. Uh, they seem to love her more and respect her more than, than they do for me, which is a good thing, I guess. All right, for those who are very open to interracial marriage, what would be your, what would you say would be the advantages of interracial marriage? And what would be some of the challenges that you guys face with different cultures coming together? I think one of the greatest advantage is, um, is, is just blending different cultures. Um, it's, it's absolutely beautiful to, to see different cultures. And 
Uh, and, and this is what I would, I would often tell candidates because we have a lot of pressure. Are you Indian or are you Filipino? And I see my kids go through that. You know, are you Indian or are you Filipino? But I think over time, we've been learning to just, uh, to kind of create this culture and an Indipino culture, okay? We're not Indian, we're not Filipino, but we are Indian and we are Filipino. So we create this Indipino culture. And I think just to embrace and to, and to bring different cultures together to kind of create your own culture, I think that's beautiful. And then, because we can, we, we can connect to literally anything. If it's something Indian, we can adopt. If it's something Filipino, we can adopt. And, you know, I, I, I heard a stand-up comedian uh, once say, he's an Indian stand-up comedian. He said that the world will eventually turn brown uh, because of all the, all the intermarrying. The, the, the world is going to turn brown. Uh, so I think Candace and I have been doing a good job uh, in that, <laughs> turning the world brown. Well, I heard that the world is turning yellow. Oh, because of the Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <Me>. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are the challenges that you guys face, especially early on in marriage? Since a lot of our listeners today will be around uh, the age of early twenties to early thirties. Yeah. Well, interestingly, it will be the very same thing, which is the beautiful thing of marriage. It's culture. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you get into marriage, and I think this is for anyone. You can even be of the same race, same culture, and you can have this issue, because everyone has their own culture. You have an ethnic culture that you grew up in, but you have a personal culture. You have a family culture. And I think one of the hardest things that we had to battle in our marriage was also bringing the cultures together. Because for me, as a family, our family culture and our Indian culture is strong. And I always felt that culture was right. If I can use the word, that culture was more superior. It's more refined uh, compared to another culture. And I'm sure Candice had her own set of cultures from a family perspective and from a ethnic uh, perspective coming together. And I think one of the hardest things that we had to battle through in our initial years of marriage, and we still, we still kind of have those moments, it's where we are able to communicate and we're able to do so without judgment when it comes to, but in our culture, that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. uh, because if, I think if we, for us, if we remained as judgmental as we were, like, you know what, ours is better, yours is not that good. Uh, you know, oh, we have been doing this for a longer time. You, you haven't been doing it that way. Uh, I think if we came that way with, with, that kind of, with, with that kind of prejudice, it would be very hard. And we can yeah. even do that at a family level. My mm. family has always done it this way. It's been very good. See where, our, see where my family is. Your family is not. So let's do it my way. Yeah. And I think, so the beauty of intercultural marriages is bringing the two cultures together. But that's also been the hard part because culture is such a big part of us. Yes. And willing to let go <laughs> Let go of cultural preferences is, is not easy. Uh, you know, when, when, we were, when we were getting married, our, our wedding, um, you know, Candace always wanted a small, intimate wedding. You know, garden, 50 guests, you know, uh, very beautiful wedding. Now, and, and I guess that's a very Filipino thing to look forward to. <clears throat> In India, um, you get married, you invite the whole town. Um, the bigger the wedding, the better. Um, we, we care less about the aesthetics. We just want the more number of people to just be packed into a place. So it's like two extremes. Uh, part of our conversation with my parents about getting married was they asked us, you need to get married in India. Because <clears throat> if we do the wedding in Dubai, we have to invite too many people because my parents have been here for over that time, about 30 years. And they're pastors. So it's like too many people we cannot we cannot say no to people. We have to invite everyone. It's going to be too expensive. So you have to get married in India. That's part of the, you know, that was part of the discussion, which we said yes to. So getting into our wedding day itself, uh, which I know is a very big part, something that Candice looked forward to. She always envisioned what her wedding would look like. 50 people, a garden, <laughs> very simple wedding. And here I am saying, okay, our wedding is going to be in India. Our wedding is going to have a couple of hundred people. Okay, our wedding cannot have all of these uh, nuances that we, you know you usually like to have. We cannot have all of these things, but we had to we had to get through it in a discussion. So we ended up doing it in India, and the one to officiate the wedding was Pastor Ruel, our our local pastor, our our, our pastor from our local church, Pastor Ruel. So that's part of our agreement with uh, with my parents. The church ceremony that we would normally do is based off an Anglican liturgy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it would look like. Again, very different from what a Filipino wedding would have. So we kind of had to marry the two. So there was hymns. There was, uh, you know, some of the things that, that the Anglican liturgy would have. But then there was also the tying of the knot, the lighting of the candle. 
So our guests who came with us from Dubai, who's never seen an Indian Anglican wedding, were very, wow, you guys sing hymns during a wedding. Well, that's new. Uh, and our guests from India, wow, okay, this thing of tying the knot, putting the veil, it's new, but we understand what you're trying to do, and that's so nice. But the process of getting there was not easy. Because we had to really say, okay, what are the things that we must have? What are the things that's nice to have? If it's nice to have, it's okay not to do it. Mm-hmm. But the must have, let's do it. Mm-hmm. And I think every day we face those kind of um, challenges. Mm-hmm. When we make decisions, because we've been shaped yeah. by our culture, we've been shaped mm-hmm. by the way how we were raised up. And I think every day we come into making decisions as husband and wife with yeah. those cultural pieces inside of us. And I think part of what I've had to learn, Pastor Dennis, personally for me, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a very analytical person. So as someone is talking to me, I, I really take out the emotion and what I see is just a flow chart. <laughs> so everything is a flow chart. Everything is yes, no. There's one of That's us where the fight starts, starts, you know. <laughs> and, and initially in our marriage, that, that, that was a deal breaker so many times because Candace would be in the middle of a very passionate thing that she's discussing. And in my mind, I've already said, this is not going to work out and I would not listen to her anymore. And I would just say, that's not a good idea. Let's not do it. I have a better idea. Listen to me. And, and, and that was something that I had to learn and God had to teach me just to listen. Mm-hmm. And part of the listening was not just listening to what she's saying, but also listening to where she's coming from, uh, culturally, where she's coming from, the way she was raised, where she was coming from. And to listen to that and then to always, you know, choose to think less of myself, because if I thought that my culture was the most impressive culture, Mm-hmm. If my culture was more superior than anyone else's culture, then I would not take time to listen. But over, but over the years, I've also learned to really say it out loud, Indian culture is not the best culture. Mm-hmm. Just like any other culture, it's flawed yeah. because it's humans. It's us who has created this culture. So there are flaws in it. But then we have to see the person, the person who has created the image of Christ, yeah. This person who God has called me to love with mm-hmm. all my life, which means I will love sacrificially. I think when the conversations go there, when the listening goes there, it makes yeah. uh, it makes making decisions a lot more easier. Yeah, that's powerful. You know, learning how to listen, learning how to study the culture of your wife. You know, even Tammy and I are both Chinese, yet her family's cu- culture is so different from my family's culture. And there's a tendency for us early on in our marriage to compare. Like yeah, we yeah. came from a family of business people. They came from a family of doctors. So yeah. the, just the school of how they do things yeah. are, are very different from how we would do things. And so we've had cool. some fights because of those uh, uh, yeah. cultural differences among Chinese. Imagine wow. how much yeah. more an interracial marriage of two very different true. racial cultures. Uh, very true. Yeah. Peter, any advice? Now, uh, going beyond race and culture, any advice? Maybe three mm-hmm. advice you would want to give a young couple or those who are wanting to get married on how to have a very successful marriage. Okay. Um, okay, this is in random order. Mm-hmm. Uh, things that, that Candice and I have learned over time. Uh, number one, um, it would be this. It would be compliment, don't compete. Um, I, any two human beings in any kind of relationship, okay, we have our sense, we have our weaknesses. Now, the thing is, when you're married, you have to make that work together. Mm-hmm. And I think so often, again, speaking from personal experience, we like to highlight our strength and deny the existence of our weaknesses. Our weaknesses don't exist. It's only our strength, and I bring my strength into our marriage. But the problem is when you have two, two people who both say, but I'm strong in this, and I'm strong in this, and then you start competing of who is better at what. Uh, and one of the things that I've had to learn is the things that I'm not good at. Okay, these are my strengths. These are things that I'm good at, but there's also things that I'm not good at. There's still things that God's heavily at work in, or the amount of grace that's there in something, that same amount of grace is not there in something else. Uh, and it's the same thing with Candace. And, and I think what, what I've had to learn, and this is what I would encourage you, uh, learn, learn to create a secure environment where it's not just your weaknesses that get spoken of, but you're also okay to admit, but I'm weak in this. Uh, because... And, and I, I like how someone illustrated this to us, Pastor Keith Towers from, from our church in, in, in Florida. He illustrated this was like, you know, if you try to just take your strengths and your spouse's strengths, you will always end up competing. But, you, but your, your hands have strengths, it also has weakness. But then it's a good thing when the other person's strengths and weakness also comes into picture, you get to, you know, you can actually get weight to, to push things up. Something like that. 
And I think part of the things that we have had to learn is that, hey, I'm here not to compete with my wife's strength. Neither is her strength need to compete with me. But together, we can complement each other. There are things wow. I'm good at, things I'm not, that she's not good at, but I'm good at. And we together make things work to move mm-hmm. forward in life. So an advice, uh, don't, don't compete, but complement one another. Uh, another thing which, um, which we've learned over time is to always think of a common future. Um, you know, if, if you've done the strength finder test, which was, very, which was very helpful in our marriage, surprisingly, do it, it might help your marriage. Um, we, we learned a lot from our frustrations with each other through, through, um, through strength finder. But there was one thing that's common between, between Candace and I is we both are futuristic and that works for us. Um, and this is something that I've learned to do more and more. Is every time we get into hard times, every time we have to make decisions together, See, because our decisions will affect our future. Uh, things that we do today, are pri- the way we prioritize things will ultimately affect our future. And sometimes we get so caught up trying to figure out the detail in the now um, that we forget about the, that we're building a future. But one of the things that we have learned to do is to start from the future in mind. And we both have learned to have conversations. Okay, so we're at five years from now. Where do you think God's going to be keeping us? So we're at 10 years from now. What do you envision that our family, you know, what do you envision our family is going to be like? And we start with a common future where it's, it's us together. It's not, hey, I have this plan, so let's follow my plan. Or you have this plan, I don't like your plan, so let's, let's again, let's, you know, let's, 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 let's battle. I, don't know. I think we have learned to build a common future. Um, and, I, and I would highly encourage, you know, if you're newly married or getting married, start learning to think of a common future rather than these are the things that I want to do. These are my things. These are my things. And then you start fighting over those things. No, just create a common future. Yeah, that's nice because uh, many would teach us about having a vision, but not having a vision together. Mm. And I think this is something critical. This is key for a successful marriage that you've got to do things together. It can't be, I'm my own woman, I'm my own man. We go our yeah. different path. It's yeah. because you got married, so it's going to be together. Something's got to give in some areas sure. of your life. And uh, I think sure. Tammy and I have learned that also through the years where there are many things, actually more on Tammy's side, that she had to sacrifice and say, not now, but mm. doesn't mean it's no, but maybe yeah. just not now because we're in this together. Yeah. 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 Very true. Do you have, if I would just, if I would just throw, yeah. if I would just throw one more. Yeah. Uh, it, would, it, would, it would really be uh, communication. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think communication is something that that just doesn't stop. Um, we never stop learning how to communicate effectively. You know, it's funny, Pastor Dennis, if you've been married for about 11 years, uh, you would think communication would get easy over time or it would just become so natural over time. But I'm realizing, no, um, the need to be deliberate is actually increasing now because there are so many things that's coming into our lives that's competing for time. There are so many things that's competing for our priorities. So communication is become, this becoming easier in the sense we get each other better. We have to use less words to get our point across or you need to use less words for me to understand what you're saying. But because there's so much competing into the world that we live in, time, energy, responsibilities, our kids are growing up. When we put all of these things, creating quality time to have quality conversations uh, is becoming so critical. You know, when, I, when this whole um, lockdown and everything happened, I thought, uh, Candace and I are going to have a lot of free time to have a lot of conversation. Um, I couldn't have been, I couldn't have been any more wrong because we're taking care of the schooling of the kids. Uh, we end up having so many zoom calls and we have the zoom fatigue at the end of the day. Um, Candace is also in the middle of a transition. She was working, uh, in the corporate world and then in December she resigned. So she's on a sabbatical. So she's, you know, just, you know, finding some time space, uh, learning new skills. Uh, and then all the video preachings, the recordings, everything happening, you know, at home. There are so many things to compete for time. So many things to compete for space. And I think it's become, we are both are realizing, man, if we don't carve out time for conversation, it's not going to happen by itself. And when we come there, we don't come there with leftover time. We don't come there with leftover energy. But really, you come with the best time. You come there with the best energy that you can still give your spouse. Uh, not just, it's, and you don't do it for the sake of conversation sake, you do it because you love the person. And, and there's something that I've learned in the last few months, maybe, you know, it's to love the person 
but also to like being with this person. You, you, you get the difference? You know, because sometimes like, yeah, I love you, so I'll forgive you, I'll, I'll accept you. That's, that's there, you know, you love the person. But I've been there saying, hey, you know what, I love you, but I genuinely just enjoy being with you. I, 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 you know, I like you as a human being. It's a delight to be with you. And that's something that I've been, I've, you know, it's like something that's dawned on me. I, I enjoy being with you. Uh, I enjoy conversations with you. Uh, and I don't do it for conversation's sake. I do it because I genuinely enjoy this. Mm -hmm. And it's been a journey to get there because I know at some point there was pressure. Oh, we need to have cons. Oh, we need to have a date night. No, you know, we should do this. You know, so structured. But I think it's learning to say, hey, you know what? I really value this. I really treasure this. I enjoy you as a person. So I want to do this. Yes. Um, it's something that, that, you know, that, that we both are learning, especially when there have been so many things to come and compete for our time. So communication, communication, communication. Nice. You, I, I don't think we can ever over communicate. Yes. And I think uh, those three lessons are really so valuable. And I do hope uh, we get all these lessons. Uh, Peter, just this podcast is so full of valuable insights coming from you. How long have you been married, by the way? 11 years. 11 years. Wow. All right. So that's 2000 and. Uh, uh, nine. Nine, yeah. All right. Got married in 2005. Yeah, so I was ahead, a bit ahead. But I think you've learned more through the years. Okay. You're more teachable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, 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 had, we had great people who surrounded us early yeah. in our marriage. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think the, the role of mentors and you know, people who stand with you is yeah. so critical. Right? We've been blessed by that. Oh, yes. And that's why we have this channel, Act Like a Man, because we want to equip and mentor men. I know it's only so online, but I do hope you have a community in your own local uh, uh, city, in your own local church. Find, uh, find good couples who can mentor you and walk alongside you in your marriage. Peter, this has been uh, so full and this has been so helpful, not just, I think, to the listeners, but to myself, right? Uh, just especially the compete and compliment illustration that you gave was really powerful. And uh, I know that many will be blessed because of the discussion that we have today. And for those of you who have an interracial relationship, now, I know it's a challenge, but listening now to my friend Peter, you know that there's really great hope and a great chance of a thriving interracial relationship. And I just want to thank you for that. And thank you for living that out. And I see that in your family and your kids. Um, and uh, again, to everyone who's listening to our podcast, thank you so much. If you like this uh uh, conversation and like this video please do subscribe and share this to your friends Peter do you have a Facebook a website a blog site that they could go to so they can learn a thing or two from you yes so our, our blog is currently being rebranded and we're having a bit of technical issue so our old blog was the isaacsjournal.com we're rebranding it to the indipinos.com we have the domain indipinos.com indipinos so, right. so when is going to have the domain but when is it going to yeah, launch uh, so if you go if you go to the if you go to the isexjournal.com or to the indipinos.com, uh, either one, it should take you to the page that we already have. All right. Okay. Yeah. So it's live. So just just, just type in the isexjournal.com and you should hit the page. If not, you can find me on Facebook, uh, which is Peter Joshua Isaac. That's yes. my name. Yes, my parents took all the Bible names and they gave it to me. <laughs> Peter Joshua Isaac. And yeah, we'll put, the link, we'll put the link on the thread below so that people can follow you. And I know awesome. they'll learn so much. So your target would be interracial uh, communities, right? With the yes, thing. that's that, that's something that we are building towards. Wow, all right. So we're excited to see that launch and uh, hopefully it can help a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, Thank you for having me, Pastor Dennis. It's yes. a privilege to have this conversation along with you. All right, God bless you. God bless everyone. And to all the men out there, continue to act like a man. 